Welcome back to the Only Tools and Horses podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Harstep Equestrian, multi-purpose clothing you can rely on. Overall, mate, it's pretty good. No one tried to stab me today. <laughs> a lot of dressage riders are overweight. Gold medal <laughs> and a burger. Yeah. Cheers, lads. What, what a day. day. <laughs> you were a member of the Royal Marine Commandos. And then started to have these weird symptoms. Like you'd think you're in a room talking to someone, <laughs> click your fingers and over hold you, you're outside. Love it. Right. Welcome back to the Only Tools and Horses podcast. Today we're joined by uh, well, Superman himself, Jim <laughs> Galvin, and uh, founder of Atlas Fitness. Jim? That is me. That is you. I'm so, mate, I'm so excited for this one. Like, I'm itching to ask you <laughs> questions. Thanks, buddy. I'm excited that you're excited, although I'm not sure what the questions are, so I'm not sure how excited I actually am. <laughs> no, exactly. You might absolutely hate it by the end of it and go, why did I even bother to do this? Now, Never. we're on an equestrian podcast, as we were saying. Um, you know nothing about horses. Literally nothing. This is the first time where I really feel like we've outnumbered Josh in horse knowledge. So yeah, There's three people that don't really know much about horses on this yeah, podcast. Yeah, exactly. So there we go. All yeah. in good company. Then. And you've somehow made a career out of it. I have no idea. <laughs> I thank my mum. No. I mean, there is so much research that I've gone and tried to do on you in the recent times as as well as we we've known each other for probably just under a year just over a year around that that year mark and it's been through fitness and and gym and we right. thought being uh in the time that we are people are locked down people are struggling to maintain their fitness and and keep a, on top of their mental health there might be a few things that you can uh throw out there that would really benefit people that are sitting at home not knowing what to do um, and also linking it back to the question thing, Josh is eager with questions of <laughs> how can how would you suggest you help with ABC? So we're all going to get onto that. But one of the things I really want to start with and absolutely blew my mind, you were a member of the Royal Marine Commandos. I was. That how did, happen, how did that true. happen? How did you how did you get into it? So basically, in my younger days, so I'm 32 now, uh, so a million years ago, when I was your age, when the world was in black and white, still, <laughs> uh, I was an athlete, so I was a sprinter and a long jumper and the kind of the goal was to to get to international level uh in track and field in some way and i messed around with a couple of different events again 100 meters long jump uh messed around with decathlon yeah it's like the male equivalent of of the heptathlon and uh, i just kept getting injured so it was almost a weird kind of petulant decision that i was like i just keep snapping my hamstrings i'm pretty much held together by blue tack and sellotape now and the military had always kind of been on the back, kind of been on the back burner a little bit, but still as an option. So I, just, I think I think it was one day when you know hamstring or hips or calves or you know twisted a sock or broke a nail or something again that I was like right I'll, I'll look into this a little bit more. Uh, and then kind of the infantry soldier world was was kind of always attractive, very much glorified in in the media with action films and stuff and different kind of propaganda. And that is how they get young guys in. And it worked on me. <laughs> right. So I just decided to join. So I applied when I was 19 uh, and I joined when I was 20. Wow. wow. That is amazing. I mean, what impact has that had on your life, being going through the, the training program to being a serving soldier? How, how has that changed your life? In kind of in, in a positive and negative way, which I think a lot of people would would admit, I think that you have certain people attracted to the military as a whole and especially the Royal Marines because it is, you know, you have, obviously I'm going to be biased, but you have certain kind of components, certain kind of departments as such within the military. And then you have the Royal Marines, which is considered to be more elite, right. which means that the training and the lifestyle in it is going to be a lot more physically and mentally arduous. So you have to have certain characteristics and certain ideals and a certain personality type to be attracted to that in the first place and then those characteristics and those that kind of those personality traits are strengthened when you're in there so overall i think it has strengthened those parts in regards to things like resilience in regards to things like attitude in regards to things like you become almost perpetually unrattleable because a bad day in civvy street is very different to a bad day in the military yeah, I can imagine. So people are like, man you know business is hard how are you doing the fact that xyz happened and i went Overall, mate, it's pretty good. No one tried to stab me today. <laughs> so it's like, so from, from kind of a standard of like perspective, yeah. it's like it, you've always got that baseline of that's, that's what our day of work <laughs> looks like. And that's for, in, and obviously in, in Civvy Street, very few things, obviously, you know, obviously some people do, yeah. but overall life is likely to be a lot easier in Civvy Street. So it can be uh, kind of a positive in that way. But the downside of that, I found uh, kind of both with myself and from a mental health standpoint with a lot of, uh, a lot of the guys that I served with, 
is that that can actually be a negative because life can be very underwhelming when you leave. Yeah. Especially for um, people who, who deployed abroad and who actually went on operations. And that kind of stopped probably six, seven, eight years ago. So I went to Iraq 11 years ago and Afghan nine years ago. Uh, so I've got kind of those those that baseline level of stimulation that you know that's what life could be like. And although yeah. that was hard, it was it was also awesome. Yeah, you, can you, can you can never recreate that. You can never recreate. You never get a, similar to like you hear about professional athletes all the time when like footballers they retire, they just go off the rails in the end because they can never get that same buzz for from walking on a pitch and getting sixty thousand fans shouting the name. Yeah, exactly right. that, and that's exact. That's exactly right, and it is that perspective. It's that contrast between that's how kind of stimulating life can be. Mm. And then it is so hard to recreate that and a lot, and some people struggle with that. Just going back a little bit as well, you were talking about injuries that like prevented you from taking the track and field further. How did that affect you? Because that must have been so hard when something was taken out of, you can't control injuries really. Yeah, are there so things true. that you look back at as well now that you uh, are like, I wish I'd done that as well. Now that you've learned for the past 10 years with the way your fitness has gone? Is there things that you missed out on your training back then that affected you or was it just luck? Uh, I don't think it was luck. In hindsight, I know so much more about physiology and about training now than I did beforehand because now, circumstantially, that is that is my job. Yes. Um, and I think that it's a combination of both my own knowledge having grown over the last decade and the fact that science and technology is now at a level where people train better. Whereas beforehand, it was all, you know, work hard it was yeah. basically application of effort focus that was everything just work harder just work harder just work harder and there is a massive amount of truth in that but at the same time you also need to a work smart generally and b make sure that you're training appropriately for your body yeah if you're eating the wrong stuff like we you know we all spoke about Some in the gym amount. recently yeah. mm. you know back pre-lockdown gyms rest in peace yeah <laughs> and um and one of the things that we were saying one of the things that i was talking to you guys about is like intolerance testing if you're if you're eating foods that that might be for the general public really really healthy but you're intolerant to spinach that's yeah. screwing up your gut that's making the the muscles surrounding your core and your spine switch off and then lo and behold you're much more likely to get injured even yeah. though you are on paper living a healthy lifestyle but it might just be not exactly and you right might not know that you have an intolerance to these things exactly that that's it that's it and this thing like intolerance testing like dna testing and all of this kind of this biological individuality, as Ross Edgley calls it, like that, these kind of testing protocols either didn't exist ten years ago or were only available for you the know athletes, Premiership yeah. football players or NFL guys in the states or something like that. Yeah, going with your your fitness training now, is it somewhat related to your time in the Marine Corps? Is it a a a because to be in the army, you've got to be exceptionally in in shape. Um, and we see you jumping heights that are stupid. We, we've tried to attempt it. It's all smoke and mirrors, mate. I've got special springs in my shoes. That's what it is. Just what, what's, show what's, the, what's the training regime to, to going through selection? Because the only thing I really know about uh, the military is SAS who dares wins and, and that selection process. I don't even know what's the difference between um, the uh, Royal Marines commandos to the SAS. Is it the same sort of fitness level that you have to go through? Uh, the SAS will be harder. So all of, you know, the SAS and what's called the SBS, which is Special Boat Service, come under this yeah. bracket of what's called UKSF, so UK Special Forces. <clears throat> and uh, that selection process is is harder than the Marines. So you've got kind of at the, t the proper top of the pyramid, you've got the UK Special Forces. And then below that, you've got a few different groups of where kind of the, the Royal Marines and, and the Paras tend to to kind of sit, they tend to be the spearheads. If anything kicks off in the world, they're usually, it's usually one of those groups that go in first. Yeah. Um, and then you've got what would be classed as kind of the basic infantry below that. Wow. I mean, I, I, there's, there was that thing recently, wasn't there, where the pirates hijacked uh, that massive shipping container. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't know how accurate it is or if it was just one of those Facebook jokes and it was apparently, because they, their operation lasted like 14 minutes, that they'd made a, a cup of coffee and by the time they'd finished operation, they got back, it was still warm. Like that, <laughs> that is insane. That's such a wicked anecdote. <laughs> like, I, 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 I hope that is true. I absolutely hope that is true. But I mean, you, so you say you served through uh, Iraq, Afghan. Mm -hmm. Have you've done? You've been on operation. You've gone out and actually done operations. And yeah. So the end of two thousand. So I finished training kind of mid two thousand nine. Yeah. And then I was um, there were about seven hundred and eighty people or something in my unit at the time. Uh, and there was, luckily, there was a, just a small group of 23 guys that were picked to go on this um, 
this Iraq mission. I have no idea what, what the hell I was wanting. <laughs> there were 23 guys that went on this Iraq mission not long after. So this was kind of December 2009, I think. So I'd only been in my commander unit for a couple of months. Uh, and we were there for about four and a half months. Came back kind of spring 2010 and went straight into what's called PDT, which is pre-deployment training for right. um, a seven-month Afghan mission the following year. Wow. Wow. I, I, I'm listening to it like a kid, yeah. just like, oh my God. I mean, I don't know if we're going to finish this podcast and like black Range Rovers are going to pull up and like pull us away. Like, you should not know this. Yeah. I mean, have you have you got missions that you've been on that you like, I cannot talk on? Like, we don't want to get you in well, trouble. Well, of course, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, luckily, no. I mean, it's not, you know, what what we were doing as, as, as Royal Marines, I think that it is, obviously it is glorified because there's certain things that they've done in the past and the Falklands and stuff, which have attracted a lot of media attention. And it is incredibly hard and we do do some cool stuff, but, you know, we're not, it's not just a league of, you know, a couple of thousand James Bonds, you know, so we don't, in terms of anything that would be like super uber sensitive uh, in terms of the kind of the information and the stuff that went on, that would all be under the UK Special Forces bracket. So I can talk about the stuff that I did because it's not particularly interesting. (laughs) If you had someone that was in the SAS on here, they might not be able to divulge. Yeah, it might be a very dry podcast. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, yeah. It was just an hour of, I can't tell you that. I can't tell you that. (laughs) Right, take. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Next question. So it sounds like it really took, when you're in that, it's your life. You have nothing else than that. That is your lifestyle the whole time. That's true, yeah. And that is the difference between uh, work in the military and work somewhere else. It's not work, it is it is everything. I mean, you're at, you know, there's a certain, uh, you know, period of time where if your unit is uh, what's called like the UK spearhead, so if anything kicks off, you know, you guys are the first guys out there. And again, I think that usually rotates between commando units and, and para units and maybe some other infantry regiments. You're at like either 24 or 48 hours notice to move for like a seven month window. Wow. So you've got to be, you know, so kind of that constant yeah, yeah. Yeah, state of readiness. And if your superiors, if your hierarchy want to go on a two week exercise, you go on a two week exercise wow. and it doesn't matter. You know, you very much do kind of in, in civvy street, if there's a wedding in six months, you can pretty much kind of confirm you're going to be there. Right. But if, if you're in the military, there is much less flexibility that you get, but you do know that going in. Yeah. So yeah. anyone that's in the military that kind of gobs off and moans about that, it's like, we kind of knew that that was going to be the <laughs> Yeah, it was in the team. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. What the hell did you think this job was? <laughs> so you, you should know that when you're going in. Um, we briefly touched on how uh, it, it is the pros and cons of not being in the military now. I mean, coming out of it, how um, how was it just adapting in general to normal life? It was, I was quite, I, so completely honestly, which again is kind of the whole point of this conversation, I found it harder than I thought I was going to. I was, I'd only been in for about four and a half to five years, something around that mark. And I, I'd never completely bought into the military system. I still had a lot of civvy friends. Um, I still had a life outside of the military, whereas a lot of guys, that is that becomes their every, especially the guys that go in younger, yeah. so especially the guys that join at 16, 17, that is their everything. Whereas I still still kept, uh, you know, a good portion of my kind of my civvy life and routines. I guess it's friends. everything they know, isn't it, really? That's yeah, exactly. That's the thing. So I think they struggle a lot mm. more than I did, but I did still struggle. So even though I kind of, I kept that uh, part of my civvy routine and civvy existence, I still struggled. And the couple of things I struggled with, one of them was what we've just been talking about in terms of everything seemed, you know, Perception. pretty underwhelming mm-hmm. yeah. and just and just a little bit dry and a little bit boring compared to the life in the military. Just nothing really seemed as poor and it all seemed a little bit trivial. Uh, and one of the things was just the lack of structure. Like it was, I was like, bloody hell, I thought I was fairly kind of self-disciplined and kind of, you know, a good amount of self-determinism and I could keep myself accountable and I could self-lead through different aspects of life. And and I think I can, but I did struggle with that when I came out because you're used to supervision and oversight 24 hours a day. Mm. Whereas when you do get so much freedom, it can be a little bit... Overwhelming. Well, yeah, like, it can, yeah, ironically, yeah. that can be... So what the bloody hell do I do <clears throat> now? I've got no yeah. one guiding me on stuff. What is the aftercare like? Do you... Do you sort of just leave and they just go, thanks for everything? <laughs> thanks God. for that, you didn't die. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, thanks for your service. Fist bump, peace out. Um, it's it's pretty good, I think, actually. I think a lot of people say that it's not it's not amazing. There are certain, there are like combat services and there's different charities that offer uh, support and, and different um, kind of vehicles of therapy and uh, kind of career advice and stuff for life. So that is like you do have access to that. So I think 
it's kind of a bit of a double-edged sword kind of answering this question. So it, it is good in theory in that it is it is there and it is offered and it is communicated about. But you've got to go to but, them. But you've got to go yeah. to them and a lot of people don't. And there is still this huge mantra in the military. Or again, for me, it's kind of, it's kind of different because I left you know eight years ago, so things will have evolved. But back then it was like, if you're struggling, you know, man, man the hell I should get on. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and that's the thing. And I, I, I don't know what it's like now. I've got a few friends and I've got a few clients that I trained that are now in the Royal Marines. Yeah. Um, but I don't know what kind of post-operation care is like because those are the guys that do struggle. It's the guys that it's the guys that that went to Iraq and went to Afghan that that do that do struggle. So I don't know what it's like now, but I imagine it's better than it was. I have there's I feel like the world we're living in now, especially in the last ten years with social media developing in the way it is, I imagine you the time you went in and joined, you're already in sort of a mental health is still an issue but probably a clearer head than most of the younger lads joining today so i imagine they're going in already uh, open to the subject of mental health and how it affects them so they're all, not delicate they're fucking guys that i wouldn't piss off but <laughs> do you know i feel like they're, it's almost like a different mentality of recruitment uh, what's going through yeah i think it's more i think it's more expected more accepted that people will have that people will struggle with mental health um, and again, that's a good thing. So we've seen a huge rise in, in, so well, well, have we seen a huge rise in mental health or have we seen a huge rise in people acknowledging that they have it because they yeah. feel comfortable to mm. acknowledge that? And it was almost the unknown before as well. No Correct. One, that's no it. One yeah. Knew, yeah. Yeah. Especially with guys. I mean, I think that, you know, we live in a world now that empowers women in, in, in an incredible way through female superheroes and different, you know, women achieving things they hadn't before, CEOs in boardrooms, yeah. et cetera. And, and that's celebrated and that's amazing. And that's a, absolutely a good thing and absolutely yeah. necessary because women haven't exactly been treated fairly historically. But I think one thing that is still a bit of a taboo is uh, is men being vulnerable with their feelings. And I think that we are starting to come out of that when men that we see as super strong, super kind of capable and super tough acknowledge that that's okay Jason Fox so Foxy from yeah. SAS who dares yeah. wins being one of them I mean he was a guy that uh, I, I believe he got I believe he got medically discharged from the special forces for uh, for PTSD and he oh. and it's because he's been open and honest about that that that's allowed kind of given a lot of other men in similar positions permission to do the same mm. was the service before like oh, you can't really come out and talk about that like we're, we're men you can't say that because it's quite a new development that he could go on TV and talk about it. Or is that something that is only just sort of changing with the times? I think it's changing more. I think it, I think it had started to change just before I probably even, well, kind of probably as I went in, in kind of 2008, 2009, but it, and it was something that was offered. Like when we got back from Afghan, you know, the, the, the guys in charge of your unit, the, you know, there was like a welfare department yeah. and it was guys, if you're struggling, talk to us. But it was still inferred. It's okay that it was not like, to be okay. It, it, exactly. And that was kind of communicated, but it was like a bit of an eye roll. It was like, you know, someone in your company, like as in, you know, your group of kind of 200 guys yeah. would be like eye rolling, like, yeah, if you need to talk to welfare, go talk to welfare if you're struggling. Yeah. But it wasn't re it wasn't communicated in a in like a genuine, authentic way. Mm. It was still it was still kind of pushed under the carpet and still looked like it was box. said, it was, yeah, as in you're reading that. from a script, exactly that. Yeah. Well, we have to make sure that they're aware that helps on offer, but, you know, man the fuck up, don't. Yeah. It was, no. was basically kind yeah. of, it was kind of the underlying message. And again, I don't know, it would probably be unfair for me to assume that the, it, the forces are still like that. Now I think it is different. Hopefully it is different. Hopefully it's different. I exactly. could go on about the military for <laughs> ages. However, we've got so much yeah. you want to discuss. Team GB. You represented Team GB in bobsleigh. I did. Never knew that. How, Random, isn't it? How, how did that happen? I don't even know where to start with the questions on that. Like, <laughs> yeah. We live in a country where... You're literally Team GB. Go. <laughs> Explain. Talk it. to me. Like we, we don't really have snow that often. How do you, you just pick up... You phoned me up and was like... Bro, you'll never guess what. <laughs> I was, I was like, like, Jim, oh my Jim's God. got a random passport. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was a really strange one. I was like, in, as living in the UK, where do you just go, yeah, bobsleigh? That's, yeah, bobsleigh. That's logical. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, so kind of bit with my background being a sprinter, um, that's quite rare in the military, especially in the Royal Marines, because the Royal Marines are just like this collective of like endurance heroes. 
And then you've got me that can run 100 meters and then 110 is like considered a marathon. So I was yeah. like, this is fine. <laughs> so uh, I started sprinting in the military for um, for the Royal Marine team and for like the inter-services, like the, the British, in kind of inverted commas, the British military had a team mm. that used to compete against like Bath Uni, Loughborough Uni, and then some of the other um, kind of decent student clubs. And uh, my, basically my first 30 meters was pretty good. So kind of... Come out the gun goes off out the blocks and I was level with guys that were running about ten point four ten point five for a hundred at about thirty meters right. uh, wow, and then I was way behind them when we got to the finish line. <laughs> so my start was pretty good a couple of guys identified that I was a bit bigger then than I am now as well so they were like you're a big sprinter that's very quick over thirty meters so I had a couple of guys approach me a couple of scouts for the the military bobsleigh team and they said come along do you fancy doing this. I was like, I don't know. They were like, you get two weeks in Germany for free. I was like, yeah, right. <laughs> sounds great. Yeah, Sold it. Spears, so it sounds great. I don't want to go camping in the field again. Like, <laughs> we do. So this, this sounds great. Do we stay in a hotel? Yes, you do. Wicked. <laughs> I mean, we're not So did that. And then at the military competition, there were a couple of scouts for the GB team. And they suggested that I go to these open trials. Uh, and across, this was in kind of throughout the course of 2012. And the GB bobsleigh team had a massive like talent ID push that year where they went to different universities, they went to different sports clubs, they looked at a lot of sprinters and a lot of rugby players, the primary, because basically you need to be a big heavy sprinter. That's right, kind of okay, how right. they, uh, kind of how they audition really. So I think they tested about 150 to 200 guys that year and dif- over different stages of selection throughout the course of the year from March kind of onwards, they just kept chopping it, kept chopping it, kept chopping it. And then I think there was about, out of the 200, there were about six of us that made Team GB that year. Wow. That's it's so much. So it's cool, man. Yeah. So they, they <clears throat> paid for me to go around the world for free and sit in a metal tube for a bit and <laughs> hopefully not crash and die. I mean, what speeds are you reaching when you're going down? So it depends on the track. Uh, anywhere between kind of 75 and 90 miles an hour. Yeah, it's pretty scary. And you're just you. in a little tin. Like, there's Mate, no you like. Are literally in a little tin with your head down, trying to be as aerodynamic as and possible. And the only safety thing you have is a helmet. There's no like airbags in the thing. No, there's no airbag. You imagine <laughs> that airbag. That'd be horrendous. Have you yeah. ever... no, no seat belts. No. I mean, have you ever crashed? Has it ever gone wrong? Like... Yeah, loads, bro. Like, like, tell not, me the my gnarliest time that you've come off of a box. So, oh, mate, so so the guy that crashed me that was my driver, yeah. a guy called Will Golder. Shout out, Will Golder. <laughs> uh, he's he's going to he's gonna absolutely. He's gonna <laughs> this. But, so if he's still representing team. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, not exactly, anymore. Yeah. Terrible driver. <laughs> I guarantee you he would never have thought he'd get on an equestrian yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so he was, I mean, I, I probably sat behind. So basically there's one in a, in a four-man sled, there's one driver and then three what's called push athletes. So their jo- as soon as you're in the sled, their job is pretty much done, right? And then the driver takes over. Um, so we, cr- uh, we crashed on a couple of different courses and normally they were okay. But basically you've got four heavy athletes, the weight of four heavy athletes yeah. and the weight of the sled. And when you go over, you don't go kind of completely upside down. You go kind of about 80% there. Right. So you're so basically you're sliding on your head at between 75 and 90 miles an hour. And you're told to basically push, a bit of a weird instruction, but push your head into the ice, right? Because, you, because you're wearing a helmet, your okay, head's protected. Yeah, yeah. Whereas if you go on your shoulder, because it's like the friction is as it is on ice, it's like harder than concrete but yeah. smooth, you'll just rip the skin off your shoulder. Yeah. That doesn't so they're right. like, at least when you're with your helmet, your head's protected. So they say, push your head into the ice. And at one point, the sled was like 80% over, and then it just rolled over onto the other side. Oh. So for a fraction of a second, all the, the weight of the whole sled and all the athletes was on my head. <laughs> Mate. Yeah, oh and it God. was like, I was like, oh... Oh, that feels weird. And I literally felt as though my chin just like went into my Your body. Your traps mate. are just burning. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, mate, this is like the wor- the weirdest reverse upside down <laughs> frog. Um, so that happened once in a place called Koningsay, which is in Germany. But when we were in Canada uh, at the end of 2013, so this was my second season, we were in Calgary and uh, and we crashed and basically it was snowing because it's Canada, Canada <laughs> right? As, as yeah. you would expect. And not like the UK. Not like the UK. <laughs> and it's completely smooth ice for everywhere on the track and, until you get to what's called the braking straight. So from the start all the way to the finish, it's a slight downhill because it has to be. It's got, you've got momentum, right? Yeah. So it's a sled effectively. It's gravity doing a lot of the work. And then as soon as you cross the finish line, a braking straight is like, it's slightly 
harsher ice to help slow you down right. and it goes uphill to help slow you down and yeah. the track is cleaned constantly constantly between every run but the braking straight it was snowing it had loads of snow in it and I was at the back so I was like the the uh, there was the driver the number two man number three man and then what's called the brakeman which is me at the back and loads of snow was coming into my helmet and I couldn't breathe right so I was, called, I was like, right, I need to, what's called pop out, which is basically where you jump out of the sled at speed. But overall, it's actually okay because you just kind of fall yeah. and then the sled moves. But what I didn't realise is I, I knocked my head a little bit when I came out. Oh. And I'd never been concussed. And I was fine for about half an hour and then started to have these weird symptoms. Like you'd think you're in a room talking to someone, you think you're here in the middle of a conversation, <laughs> click your fingers and over hold, you're outside. And you're like, how the fuck did I get here? <laughs> and you're literally like, you have these weird gaps in time where you yeah. just, where it just like, it, you just black out. Mm. That so, concussion's never gone away, mate. We're not actually here. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Head. I'm still in that time loop. <laughs> <laughs> Damn, how do I get out? And, and so, and these symptoms like kept happening. And then luckily one of the guys that was on my crew is an Oxford educated doctor. That helps. So he, yeah, we which helps. So he was looking at me like, yes, Jim, I don't think this is normal behaviour. <laughs> and uh, and he found, and at one point he found me like out, because I was like walking around looking like I didn't know where the hell I was. And he found me outside next to our sled, like almost like curled up on the floor <laughs> in, the, in the snow. And he was like, and bear in mind, every, like all of these guys, like big birdie guys, like this guy's about 120 kilos lean. And he just picks me up and he goes, and I'm and I'm like I'm behind this thing. It's the most ridiculous. I'm so glad I get to tell this story. <laughs> this is for you, Will Goldish. <laughs> Flipping kept the right way up, and um, and I'm there, crying my eyes out, and I don't know why. And he picks me up, and I basically blacked out. And he's like, Jim, why are you crying? And I turned around and went, What are you talking about? And I didn't realise that I was on the floor crying my eyes out, completely concussed. And he was like, yeah, you can't push again. I went, mate, I'm fine. What are you talking about? I could barely stand up. I think Will made the right decision there. <laughs> Fair play. <on> <laughs> yeah, I don't yeah. understand how you you automatically just went back to the bulb side. Like, I can get back in. Guys, I can go I'm again. fine. But that's crazy, Seriously. though, that the aftercare of the bobsleigh, like, I think nowadays, when you think rugby concussions... The NFL. Yeah. Like, it was nothing. By the sounds of it, it was no like aftercare for like, Yeah, I mean, to, to be fair, luckily there were there were medics on site and right. they were like, you know, we think you should, you know, we think you should take you to the hospital or whatever. Yeah. But because that, because uh, one of the guys, Henry, who was the Oxford educated doctor, he was like, he was like, I'm a doctor. I can, I can there's yeah. no point taking him to hospital because all they're going to do is sit there and keep an eye on him. Whereas yeah. if he stays, if he just stays here with us, then we, then I can keep an eye on him. Do the same, yeah. So they no, just exactly. kind of, they they just allowed it to go because yeah. there was literally, he was a doctor basically on, although mm. obviously he wasn't on duty, he was a doctor on site. Mm. So then I was like concussed for the rest of the day and then went out that night. <laughs> <laughs> As you would. As you would, yeah. What's your proudest moment representing GB? Oh, mate, that's a great question. I have no idea. Um, <laughs> Nothing, I didn't win anything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, to be honest, I just, I just turned up for the free travel. <laughs> um, there was one race in a place called Eagles, which is just outside Innsbruck in Austria, and we had a race there, and uh, we... You have your first run, and then what they do is they basically reverse order you for the second run, so the person who's, uh, who's like, ranked 20th goes first, and then 19th, and then 18th. And whatever, so you kind of you can see the placements as you go up. Right. And I think after the first run, we were ranked uh, like eighth or something. And so on the second run, we went eighth from last. Right. Okay. And then the next sled came down, uh, and we'd like just so basically in theory, every sled should be getting quicker, quicker, quicker because they almost start with a bit of a head start because they keep the excitement themselves. as well. Yeah, yes, exactly. Because yeah. it's, it's still a spectator sport, and um, and then the one that like the one that was ranked seventh came down after us, and we were obviously expecting to beat us. But our driver, a guy called Lamindine, had such an unbelievable run on that second run. Uh, we beat the sled that came seventh, and then the one that came sixth, and then the one that came fifth, and then the one that came fourth. And we were literally like, at come the on, it's of the track, happening. Watching this thing come down, like because watching it on the big TV screen, because I think yeah. it's been um, uh, transmitted. I think it's been broadcast on Eurosport at the time, and I think we came. Uh, I think we came fourth in that one. But from like eighth. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah, that and it was like which is massive. super rare. Yeah. Super so every single sled that came down, we were like, okay, yeah, we're not we're not we're not gonna be leading off of this, but we like stayed yeah. in first place effectively for three or four runs. And that was just it was just such an amazing vibe. Mm. Yeah. Such an amazing cut because it's so so rare that, that happens. So that's a pretty wicked moment. Was it quite an intense experience for you being part of the Bob Stay team or it was it, there a lot of pressure or um I don't know if I, it was definitely intense. I wouldn't say there was a lot of pressure. I think it's different now, but back when, uh, back in my day, back when we were doing it, it was as well as being an athlete, you were 
like a bit of a sled dog. You were a mechanic. You were everything because you had to kind of you had to make sure that your your team sled was all right. You had to sand the runners before race day, which took about two hours per runner, and there's just four of them. So it was like a long old process. So it wasn't particularly glamorous. So you think of kind of Team GB international sport as being something where you know you're kind of chauffeured around and it's a very glamorous lifestyle. Yeah. And it wasn't. It was pretty spit and sawdust at the time with bobsleigh because you were. You would do you you had to do everything yourself, so you didn't have a crew as such. Like you were as well as being an athlete, you were a crew. So there was a level of intensity and high expectation with that. But that was quite fun it, in a weird way. It was quite nice that it was quite rugged that you were, you know, you weren't warming up in a state of the art arena. You were warming up in a, like an underground <laughs> car park because it was one of the only places that was dry. But then you went out, and then there were cameras there that were like, and you knew you were live on Eurosport. So <laughs> wow. so yeah, so that that crazy, part was pretty cool. And, I, and at the time, I was like this is wicked. I've literally, you know, I was in Afghan a year before and then I was there and I was like, what a weird, how, fun, how funny insane. life is, right? Yeah. That you kind of go from one, one crazy experience to the next. That is insane. I mean, I think how you can relate to that is through pressure of perfor- uh, performing, competing. And yeah. And again, we have to do the not so fun stuff, look after the horses. Yeah. So like we just jump on the horse. We have to do the, the whole, the whole process really like the whole process so it's yeah it's funny but you sound like a complete and utter adrenaline junkie uh yeah maybe it's weird i don't really kind of class myself as one because there are there are a couple of things that well more more than a couple but of the things that do scare me i don't like being scared so sometimes i force myself to do things i don't want to do because i don't really want to be hostage to to not want to reckon that's a military trait I think so, maybe. maybe. I don't know. I think I think partially. I think the mili- again that would probably would have been a characteristic that some people have, some people don't. Uh, I think I think there are a lot of people that are ahead of a lot braver than I am out there, both in the military and not. <laughs> you guys, <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely present company included. Um, but yeah, I think a, a adrenaline junkie with with the right stuff. Yeah. Would you have? We have to relate it to horses. That's not a question. Yeah. Podcast. I'll roll in your eyes. Um, <laughs> and uh, going on, on what you're bound. saying for competing, how did you deal with pressure and stress? So, for people that are listening, especially younger listeners that are going in for the first time of competing and they've got the nerves, and you, you're better on going through it. Yeah, how would course. you advise? How did you handle these high pressure situations through Team GB, the, the Royal Marine Commandos? How do you deal with stress, pressure, nerves? I think like like everything else, like training, like nutrition, like everything else you would do to improve your performance on game day, you've got to realise that, dif- that different people are different people and there's not one strategy. So if you're naturally quite extroverted, you might like warming up, going around, high-fiving, fist-bumping everyone else that's there on game day, making friends, having a laugh, listening to some music, whatever. And that's that fuels you, right? So that energetically charges you. If you're not wired that way and you prefer to be a little bit more introverted and introspective in your approach and you prefer to be a little bit quieter, do whatever you need to do kind of warm up wise and then uh, kind of sit in the corner and get in your own head and get ready, then do that. It's almost like you're saying that it's a routine, <laughs> like you've got to have a routine and structure to your warm up for competition. But I think this is something that we find, what well, I find quite shocking really is we spend so much money on horses and making sure that the horse is in the top condition to mm. compete. No one really takes a diet seriously. No one warms up before they ride. No one really gyms either. Is there, not, is there not like a gym program <clears throat> that uh, uh, jockeys, riders in general do? Is there like certain not exercises really. you can do that are the best? Of course, for... like for us, realistically, we've got to try and be strong in our core. Mm-hmm. It's it's weird. You've got to be strong but soft at the same time because obviously it's that all about posture. Nice. <laughs> 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 Should have thought about my words. Yeah. Then. Should have really, but yeah, it's, we're still talking about horse riding. Yeah. I have no idea, <laughs> mate. Half the time, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's all about posture with especially with dressage and then eventing's more fitness because you're literally going five six minutes around a course mm. and you're in a certain position for that period of time. And you, well, again, this is what you're making a judgment over a massive fence that isn't going to come down, a split decision because you're going at speed. And if you, you make the wrong decision, the fence is going to win. You're yeah. your, you and the horse are coming second to the fence. So, so why do you think that is then? Why do you think it's something that is, just isn't looked I at? Think do the, the riders not think it's going to make much of a difference? I, I don't think so. I think people just think it's all about the horse. But what I don't think people realise is being fitter, having a cleaner diet, 
makes you think better mentally. So when you're under pressure, mm. you can make clearer decisions. Of course, like when I'm doing a dressage test, no, maybe I'm not working physically as hard as other sports, but I've got a million things going through my brain. I've mm. got to make split decisions <laughs> within a moment. And they've got to be the right decisions because if I make the wrong decision, I'm going to be losing marks and that's yeah, going to affect yeah, my performance. But I don't know. It's such a weird thing. And we talk about it quite often, really. It's like, there's not many people that really go to the gym that I can laugh at the top of my head that really see it as an elite performer. We've got Charlotte Dujardin who literally, 2012 Olympics, she won pretty much everything. Like gold medal after gold medal after gold medal. And she, I know she has really taken after like running and keeping herself as fit as possible. But then you compare it to a lot of riders that they don't really see it. They don't treat themselves as an athlete, mm. which I think is weird because... You think they try and gain the edge on the horse, but they don't on themselves. Yeah, you think you've got to gain them small percentages, even if it's like the extra 0.1%. It's got over a period of time. It still adds up. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and at an elite level in any sport, you know, a fraction of 1% might be in, might be the difference yeah, between gold totally. and fourth. Yeah, like, exactly. It's, it's, you know, that's, that's huge. I mean, one thing you mentioned there that's interesting to me, because I'm doing a lot of research at the moment into into basically different ways to hack your cognition mm-hmm. and your kind right, of mental okay. acuity. Mm-hmm. So in terms of... Um, reaction time in terms of clear thinking is that something that a lot of riders do because obviously yes. you said you need to be in that position to make sure that you're making the right decisions yeah again I think it's what we need to do whether riders do do that mm. it's a completely different topic I think maybe you might get a bit more support in the world class program but I can't speak from experience I've not been on that I've done the ace apprenticeship young professional award but there's nothing really there we were we were up at Hartbury College and we were like had help up at Hartbury College but that's as good as it got he did, they just stuck you on a what like for five minutes and really? said cycle and you're like this is educating potentially that was the ace apprenticeship so potentially like top people that are going to go and make a sport of this like just a what point yeah have, have, have you seen have you seen a change so like that is kind of like that might be indicative mm. of what it's like at the moment have you seen that it has improved or do you I think that it is improving I can't talk from experience, I don't really know anyone that's doing that now. Right. But what I can say is if I look at the top riders, do I think they're physically fit? No. Yeah, that's interesting. That, so even and, at top level. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And what do I think? They probably are all, they eat shit. That, I know yeah. from experience. Yeah. Because you go to a competition, you'll all see them stand at the burger van. Mm-hmm. Who actually, t- that is genuinely I'd serious. I'd sign up for that sport. Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, like, gold medal <laughs> and a burger. Yeah. Cheers, lads. What, what a day. <laughs> what a day. <laughs> but I just think they don't put, take it seriously. No. A lot of dressage riders are overweight. Mm. Oh, Surely that can't controversial. be. Controversial. Yeah, but I say it. I would have thought at the very least in terms of like physical fitness and health is obviously a huge broad yeah, topic. Absolutely. But I would have thought at the very least they would have made sure they controlled their weight. But you're saying that's not even the case. No. They wow, don't care. man, that's crazy. But you think again, surely that's going to help. Yeah. Like that's just something so small. Being physically fit is going to help you. Yeah. No matter what. What's structured to your fitness and the fact we've got a gym here, the guru. This is going to be interesting. <laughs> the, the, the guru. Where, what One day, um, fitness would you recommend for for riders who don't have any experience or knowledge in fitness? Would you do and then you correct him with all of your? <laughs> I'm <laughs> the, 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 I think I'm going to need to correct him. So, he knows more than me. <laughs> so it's been quite interesting. I went for a stage where in my head I thought. The skinnier I am, the better I'm going to look on a horse. So when I was like 17, 18, I just ran and ran and ran. So I was down about, at one point I was about eight and a half stone. But what happened is I fell off a lot. So I was riding naughty horses. So what then happened? I broke a lot. <laughs> like when I'm falling off a hundred pound horse, I think. Yeah. And you're hitting the ground, you're going to break. <laughs> There's not a lot of me. Whereas now I'm bigger. <laughs> he went on a bobsleigh. Pack it in. Yeah. I <laughs> now I'm bigger. Um, my injuries are a lot less. If mm. I fall off, I don't get damaged as much. So I genuinely think a lot of people's thought process, like even in the gym though, it's just, you see a lot of people just go in and use the running machine, whereas they don't realise how good weight training is for you. Um, so for me personally, the transition, I'm about 11 stone now and I sort of stay in. That's good weight for me with my riding mm. as well because I don't want to look too big on a horse yeah, yeah. because it just looks stupid. But for injury prevention, for back pain, things like that, people don't really like, when you've, the amount of power that you're receiving from a horse, it's crazy. I know we, so much more research should be done into that, the amount of power coming through a horse, whether you're jumping, doing dressage, racing, or whatever. Um, but 
we're not meant to be sat on a horse. No. <laughs> it breaks your body. Imagine like, it you see helps. like riders that are 70, 80, they, like your uncle, for example. Yeah. He's so broken from all the falls that he's had and everything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be fair, he's not wrong. Like, yeah. I, I can imagine that repetitive. So much because you're beating. riding eight, nine horses a day and we're not supposed to do that. But no one that is then in the gym thinking, right, I need to strengthen my back. <laughs> That's yeah. It's just so funny to hear because I would have thought, I mean, at kind of recreational level or maybe kind of low level, I can kind of understand mm. that that other priorities would kind of would would take priority yeah. they take precedence over over physical fitness but i'm it's just it's so i'm just sh- bloody shocked to hear that at an, at an elite level they're not even looking at that mm. you know strength for injury proofing also the more weight training that you do you become you get literally get a better mind muscle connection so in terms of fi- i mean again i know nothing about equestrian <laughs> i will all <laughs> that now but i would but i would have thought with like fine movement control like fine muscle control is important to make sure that you're in control of oh, your body to then be in control of the horse that is improved with strength training and with different movements mm. you're making the sm- especially with dressage you're making the smallest aid possible that people don't even see it it's all mm. about the way you distribute weight so sitting on one seat bone slightly more than the other so it's almost you don't want to see what we're doing but we're doing so much um so you, like you say like it's crazy that the sport is so uneducated on how beneficial strength training can be like i'm the best i've ever been in my riding and so much of that is due to the gym mm. and riding less as well but people get it in the head they need to ride loads but they don't actually see the benefit of going to the gym, doing something completely different is actually going to improve your riding right? rather, rather than riding 10 horses. I ride five horses now and do an hour and a half in the gym. Yeah. Well, I mean, kind of, you know, like the, the old adage, like in every crisis, mm-hmm. there is opportunity. I suppose for the guys that are listening to this or watching this now, for those of you that are, that, that are riders and that are aware that that is like a gap in everyone's performance, mm-hmm. I suppose all of our advice to anyone uh, that's kind of that's in that situation would be, use that as an opportunity to kind of clinch back 5% mm. that no one else is doing. You can improve yourself yeah. in a way that no one else is doing. Mentally so it's like it's on the table yeah. ready for you. Yeah, mentally and physically. Well, imagine your, your, your confidence as well. Like one, we all, we all know that going to the gym helps go through mm. day-to-day your confidence builds. But if you are smaller and you're falling off and you're feeling those injuries, mm. just overall, if you're bigger and you're falling off, you'll have more confidence to get back on because yeah. you're not feeling it. Yeah, you will, but just be, you'll, you'll be more robust. You'll be injury-proof and you'll just be more robust. Like from falling off and riding horses, like I worked with a physio, he was amazing, but he said I've got the back of a 30-year-old because of just the consistent repetition of just mm. all the time. Yeah, impact, yeah. Um, and since doing deadlifts has changed everything because I've been able to make my back stronger. So there's not that consistent tear on my back. Yeah. So those impacts aren't make it, aren't exactly. doing damage no, anymore. Exactly. Yeah. So instead of being able to barely get out of bed, I can get out of bed. Okay. But again, no one in the sport tries to educate you what to do off the horse to keep yourself fit. It's only been me learning from other people and doing my own research and thinking outside the box. Yeah. How can I try and go make myself better within the sport? Because I'm not the most talented rider in the world. So how can I try and catch Give you up? Our, have an edge like, on what else. is that little bit more that yeah. I can do to try yeah, and gain yeah, that absolutely, edge? Man. That's and that's good. something... I guess that's the initiatives, <clears throat> the initiative the listeners have to take is it's not like there are, like you go for Team GB, there's all this in place, we're going to do fitness or the military, we're going to do this and this is your resume. Because there is nothing in, in place at the moment, people need to be going, right, off my own back, yeah. let's do this. And then you'll see the, the huge Yeah, it's got to be self-led results. by the sound of it. What are you doing at the moment for fitness with no gyms? Well, I'm lucky that obviously I run a fitness business and I basically pimp, well, as you know, I pimped out uh, pretty much all of my kit to different people. But being completely self-serving, I took the stuff I wanted to first. Well, actually, <laughs> since, since, actually I will say, <laughs> since, since the first lockdown, I've got a row machine, I've got an assault bike, um, kind of squat rack bar, about 150, 160 kilos worth of plates and a bench. So it's pretty much everything you need really for, yeah, yeah, yeah. for you know, foundations. Um, and I've got all of that in my spare room slash kind of PT studio. So so that's the benefit that I, I'm actually okay. Yeah, I was going to say, you can't. how would you advise people with no gym equipment to uh, <laughs> to go, well, I have a bench. I have a, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. What would you suggest to people that stuff. literally have, have nothing who have come from either want to get into fitness or 
have lost the gym. I and mean, there is a massive outcry. People, we all know, that have gone to the gym that are really struggling not having it. If they don't have that, the, the equipment available, what can they do? To- I think there's two... I think if, if you look at it kind of in the remit of there's there's two different... I mean, obviously, this is hugely more expansive than this, but if there's two different brackets of stuff of stuff that you can do in the gym to improve your fitness, you can, you can get stronger or you can work on fitness and endurance and capacity in, in that sense. But for kind of the endurance side there's a million and one things you can do without kit you can go for a run you can go for like a, a weighted walk you can go for a cycle you can do a million as long as you kind of you're getting your heart and lungs going you're probably improving your aerobic capacity right strength stuff obviously is a little bit more difficult because your body only weighs a certain amount yeah. so past the point where body weight squats and press ups and, and pull ups step one would always be to get to a stage where where those movements are kind of comfortable and then beyond that you need to add extra resistance. That's what weight training is, right? You add more resistance than, than just of your own body. Um, buying gym kit now, I'm aware, you know, as much as I'd crazy love to say, money. it's crazy money, crazy money, because the demand is just so high, right? Yeah. Like, it's a good flipping time to be in that industry. No, exactly. But there are a couple of other things that you can do. I mean, depending on how strong you are, one of the things that we're doing on our online session for um for kind of our boot camp classes is we're getting guys to basically just put together a like a heavy loaded backpack so put, i don't know a household in the uk that won't have a rucksack or a bag in it yeah <clears throat> fill it up with water bottles and books or something mm. and then basically tie it up enough that it's at least fairly solid and this you can yeah you, know, you can press that overhead you can squat with that you can do whatever so that just adds a little bit of extra resistance but if you want to get kit one of the things that i just think is some of the best stuff in the world is resistance bands. Mm. Yeah. Because they're so light, they're so uh, movable, they're so versatile. Affordable as well. And they're so yeah. cheap, yeah. man. That's yeah. the thing. Like, you know, you, you buy kind of three different resistance levels on them and they're usually different colours and different thicknesses or whatever. And all three of them might cost like 25, 30 quid. That's the thing. Yeah. It's so affordable. Get yourself on Amazon and get a few of those because there's a million and then just literally put into YouTube like resistance band work. Different training. There's a yeah. million one different things you can do. You are... The founder of Atlas Fitness. That's true. That it is. It is. I've yeah. done my research. I <laughs> yeah. do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> that is about. true. I googled it. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have done a uh, Atlas session. Um, you did, once yeah. Upon a time. That's true. I <clears throat> struggled, mate. I really struggled. It was brutal. Like I don't think you appreciate. Like you, you see big guys and you think, oh, they're in great shape. They're they're extremely strong. But the the training that you do is a different level i call it superman training <laughs> because what we was doing i mate when i struggled i think at one point i was so embarrassed i had to say to jim i was like oh you were that guy that was in tears in the corner. yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. That, that was me now. that, that was me now. i've, I've since gone back to Good the to gym since then and sort of do it <laughs> how, how did atlas come about so it was kind of always the plan really for um even before i joined the marines actually i knew that i would probably only spend uh, four to five years in there and then leave and uh, start my own fitness business obviously kind of bobs i came about and that kind of took over for a while because I thought I can still start that. You detoured. I, I detoured, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Got, got, got distracted for a couple of years. Um, East Grinstead was the town I went to school in, so I moved back to East Grinstead and, uh, and set up the company from there. And it's just kind of evolved. So Atlas is basically kind of the parent company for um, three different arms of a business. One of them is a one-to-one personal training side of things, which uh, is myself and some of the other coaches. We have our own kind of client portfolio. One of them is something called the Better Body Club, which is a little bit more kind of commercial boot camp esque. So right, big, okay. big group kind of conditioning classes, hit classes. And then one of them, the one that you took part in, is uh, something called ADC, which is the Athletic Development Club, which is a little bit more functional fitness side of things. So that's basically we look at a way of kind of the functional fitness in inverted commas is the approach of trying to make you improve all components of fitness to make yourself a better all round athlete. So you do want to get fitter. But at the same time, you want to get stronger, you want to get faster, you want to get more powerful. So how do you com- how do you improve all of those components of fitness at the same time? And then that's what ADC is. So it's, it's, it's kind of similar to CrossFit in terms of the same objective to become a better all-round athlete, but just slightly different exercise prescription, I guess. Do you have any online coaching or is it all like in person? Uh, it's all in person. Well, it's yeah. all it's all, all online. It's all online. online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but but <laughs> usually it's it's in person. And the reason for that is... Uh, one of the kind of the fundamental parts of our brand is I believe that we live in a world now that is, even though we are kind of hyper-connected through technology, and again, that has its merits, we are so blessed to live in a time where we're able to do this, right? We're able to have this conversation and hopefully 
uh, you know, impart some wisdom and add some value and then and then send that out there to the masses. That's one of the joys of technology, yeah. the joys of the internet. But at the same time, living in that world, we do fit, we do exist in a time where we are disconnected more so than ever before. People feel a sense of alienation more so than ever before. Um, and people are busier than ever before. They are more hectic and there are so much more time sensitive matters people you know they have to raise their kids on their own whereas historically we you know we did that in you know village of people commute to work super busy days come back so to create an environment where people can come along they can park their brain for an hour decision fatigue is a, is a thing that i'm obsessed with at the moment which is why you see loads of like silicon valley mm. ceos like mark zuckerberg who only has three t-shirts yeah. So one of the things it does, literally picking from one of three, I mean, the guy's worth like 50 million <laughs> and he's got yeah. three t-shirts is because it takes that decision out of his cognitive process, mm. right? So that's kind of what we try to do. The the One of the foundational parts of Atlas is that we create this environment that people come, come along to. And even though they're, you know, they're sweating, they're panting and their legs might be aching by the end, they're actually recharged mm. yeah. because they get to park their brain for an hour, get told what to do, get led. Uh, and then by the end of that, they actually feel better and they feel more kind of mentally and emotionally restored. So that's one of the reasons why we've kept everything in person up until this point, because that's kind of a fundamental part of the business. So what would you say to someone that's listened to the podcast going, okay, look, I'm a horse rider. I realize maybe I've got to do some strength training. So shit, I've listened to this yeah. and I need to sort myself out. Yeah. What would you say? Because a lot of people are put off because they think, I don't want to go to a gym because mm. I have no idea what I'm doing. So what would you say the best bit of advice for someone that is goes, okay, I want to do something about it, but I don't actually know what to do? I would say, so there's kind of there's two messages. One of them would be, again, like we said, there are, there are so many merits to the kind of the technological world that we live in. You've got access. The internet basically gives pretty much everyone in the Western world unlimited access to all of the information throughout human history. Mm. It's a pretty big library, right? Yeah. Get yourself on YouTube and just search whole body strength sessions. Mm. How do I, you know, and you know you need to use your legs, you know you need to use your back, uh, you know, kind of all the stabilizers in your spine. You've got to have strong arms and shoulders to ride, right? That's basically the whole body, yeah, but, exactly. but with yeah. those movement patterns and those muscles involved. So get yourself on YouTube and just, and just, and, and, and put, like type that in and then and then do whatever comes up. So you're never going to be short of ideas. And with that, I will kind of re remember the mantra that if you're currently doing nothing, if you're currently doing very little, yeah. I should say, anything you do is going to be of a benefit. Right? Yeah. So it's like, oh, I want to make sure that I do the right thing in regards to the training. And I get that and that's a good approach to have. But if you're currently doing jack and you're doing <laughs> no strength training at all, you, you literally pick up a resistance yeah. band and you're getting stronger. So that's the yeah. benefit yeah. of being at kind of training age zero. So that would kind of be the first message. The second message is if you are at a stage where you're you're fairly conditioned, but you want to improve your riding even more and you want to improve your performance even more, even though, because I'm pretty direct with this, so this might sound a little bit mean, but if the gym is scary, if it's going to help you... Make that sacrifice. Make, yeah, make yeah. that sacrifice. Like at the end of the day, you cannot wait for something to not be scary anymore no. before you do it. No. Something being difficult loop. is not a good enough reason to not do it. Fact. Yeah. No, yeah, and so if it is, you will not improve. But those that's what bravery is, right? Yeah. That's it's what's not gonna hold them back, isn't it? Exactly, exactly, exactly. And that's what that's what courage is, right? It's not that something isn't scary, it's that something scares the shit out of you. But you do it anyway. Something being scared doesn't prevent you from doing it. It just it's a little bit of kind of an emotional strangling. But just remember that the decision of whether or not you do go is still yours. Mm, yeah. The decision's not made because it's because it's intimidating. I get that it's intimidating. But if you develop the, the mantra and kind of the internal introspective narrative that even though something's scary, I'm going to give it a crack anyway, then that will be game changing, not only for your riding and not only for performance, but for your entire life. Because you'll start to recondition your mind and say, actually, give it a go. last mm, time yeah. something was scary, I did it anyway. And now it's not scary anymore. Yeah. And that yeah. one of those in life in one way it's a microcosm for that message. As soon as you get that message in your brain, it's game changing. And plus, even if it goes wrong, what really, Yeah. how bad was it? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and yeah. then you realise the risk to reward ratio and go, well, exactly. actually, exactly. it doesn't pay off. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. I still tried something and I still bettered myself for it. Exactly. And, and if you think you're going to look, if you think you're going to do the wrong thing, remember anything you do is going to be better than what you're doing now. If you think you're gonna, you know, there are gonna be other people in the gym that are stronger than you, probably, yeah. Who cares? And they I guarantee you, they be. don't care. They're the, be always, they're the always ones that are the nice. I'm, I'm, yeah, we, true, exactly. Uh, yourself, Jim. Like, uh, it's the bigger people, the <clears throat> people that, the people that have got the knowledge behind them. 
are the ones that are more willing to help. Yeah. And and I didn't get that going in the gym two some odd years ago. And I was so nervous. I, oh God, I can't train in the free weight section. I, and I, I wish if I'd started that seven months when I first started training, had actually gone straight into the free weight section and said, do you mind if you give us a hand? I don't know mm. really what we're doing. I feel like I'd, I'd be seven months ahead of where I am now. Mm. And it's that level of what you say, don't let the fear overwhelm you on that because risk to reward ratio. What, what do you have to lose? No. Okay. All right. Oh, risk. Okay. Well, now I've got a, a, a huge different amount of knowledge and different areas and, and branch. We that also forward. make it okay. a lot, seem a lot worse in our head as well. Don't we? We always make things seem a lot harder, a lot more difficult in our head. But like one thing that I've always found, found with you, Jim, is that you're so helpful to anyone that asks that is, some such an asset and is that something you, i appreciate that is that something that you've developed from life or is that always how you have been i think there's a i think i kind of i, I grew up with a certain level of empathy mm. and i i remember what it was like to be scared yeah. so when i was in when i was in team gb as an example before i was the brakeman right on the back i was one of the guys on the side handle and i was i mean i'm about 84 kilos now when i was doing bobsleigh internationally i was 93 so it was a wow. lot bigger than i am now yeah. and i was the lightest and smallest side handle man in the world so i'm used to being in a situation where where people are better than me but you just have to again you need to recondition your mind to thinking that that's a that's actually a benefit yeah because the person that you know if you've got a million and one people around you that are better than you you're going to get better by being in that environment and being yep. in that space yeah so i think there's a level of just memory of i remember what it was like to be in that position and uh, and i'm happy to to help anyone who needs it because i because pe- i was lucky enough and blessed enough to have people help me and uh, and if there's a way that i can kind of pass that on and and and, and help other people out then and, and speed up their journey yeah, yeah. then then I'm, I'm happy to do that and I think again like you say it goes back to the way that social media has changed everyone <laughs> the perception people think that you're not around to help or even to ask for help a lot of people wouldn't feel that they could ask for help whereas like I said like you say you're when you look in the gym you're one of the fittest guys in there um, and your the way your body is is crazy in comparison comes to with it. a t-shirt <laughs> I'm actually it's seven crazy. stone I'm actually seven stone under <laughs> I don't know whoever's watching this video just got jobs just coming I ended up yeah, yeah. smacking the mic and it slowly <laughs> started to and I was like I was like if we keep this rolling then uh, I feel like we'll, we'll be we'll, alright we'll find a cut we'll just keep on gym you won't even notice that Giles is coming <laughs> no Giles is here now I feel like it's too long we can't it's, it's a benefit of having such a good got, crew exactly they come in nice and quiet and then every so often <laughs> like, a tech ninja I, I need your help so this if everyone's not watching this and just listening to this that's what's currently going on I'm so sorry you... about the noise there <laughs> the first time in, in, in a while it's not been you it's been it's me so <laughs> mm. we'll, yeah, we'll exactly. swap over there we go. Exactly. it goes even now but yeah going back to what I was saying is again it's people's perceptions because if I went into the gym for the first time I'd look at you and be like oh I feel like I couldn't ask him like, I'd stay out of his way whereas yeah. really like I say you're one, 100% the most helpful person in the gym and I think I that's that. people's perceptions of gyms is the fact that it's scary and everything and maybe in a way gyms need to present themselves in a way that's more helpful and better sorry that was just <laughs> falling yeah, my yeah. <laughs> the tech ninja fell over <laughs> exactly slowly uh, yeah but I mean I think again I think it's I think the difference is the thing that I've that I'm I guess I'm lucky to have is as soon as you make the realisation that if you're around a lot of people that are better than you you can either see that as a positive or a negative mm. if I went into a gym in like a before like a, an NFL performance gym in America and I was the weakest little feeble stick insect in there I'd be like, this is fantastic because I'm going to be sm- I'm going to be more knowledgeable, more informed, and stronger, and more well connected in an hour and a half when I leave. Yeah, and that is like again, it's easier said than done, and I get it, and I understand the feeling of intimidation, but a try and just try and see it as a positive because if you're around people that are that are better than you, you will you will leave there better. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, and B, you've just got to push through fear. There's a million and one kind of self development, uh, kind of personal growth. Uh, bits of literature and different books and audio books and stuff and materials that are about how to alleviate fear. And that stuff is incredibly helpful. Mm. But at the same time, crunch time will come yeah. where you just have to say, I am still shitting myself, <laughs> but I'm making the decision to mm. push through this anyway. Yeah. You cannot wait to do, you cannot wait until you don't feel scared of something to do it no. because you will never do it. No. And I think again, going back to what we're saying is there's so so much accessible to a lot of people to be able to go, okay, 
like I've got, I can use these foundations. I can mm. use those things like the audios and everything about how to deal with, with fright and then work on that and then be able to go and use that to my advantage and take that first step into the gym or that first step into something out of your comfort zone. Uh, but like you say, it really, people have got to change the mentality and go, okay, well, if I go in there and I'm bottom, bottom tier, right at the bottom of the pile, being in there, being around them people, all it's going to do is educate me and make me grow. Make mm, better. That's it. Yeah. Atlas. Atlas. Going back to it. Yeah. Where do you see it in five, ten years' time? What's the, what's the end goal? Oh, good question, man. I've wrestled with this uh, a lot over, again, one of the benefits of in, in every crisis, there's opportunity. And I was like, right, first lockdown, that will give me the opportunity of, of time, which is something that was kind of the gift that it gave a lot of people. And I reflected on that a lot. And we have had um, a couple of you know, pretty severe kind of punches in the face in the universe over the last year. So we were attempting to run a competition called the Atlas Games, like a functional fitness competition, which is very much on brand with us. So nothing overly technical, no Olympic lifting, no handstand walks, no gymnastic rings, just teams of four, both men, women and mixed, kind of pitting themselves against the foundations of human performance, right? And that we could handle up to about 850 competitors, this was going to be held at, at Bramwell Tice School wow. uh, this this summer in August, and we put probably ten between ten and fifteen grand into it, and obviously it all all, all went to pot mm. with COVID. Yeah, and then we found a commercial unit, and we were going to open up our first our first gym. We were going to open up Atlas One. Got everything designed, all the schematics done, surveys, reports, change of use with the council was currently in. Um, we had a million and one different quotes. We had structural engineers in. Uh, kit list set up, developing relationships with loads of different kit suppliers, etc. And there was uh, basically there was there was a problem with the power, and the UK net UK power network put kiboshed it, and that cost probably another seven seven or so grand. Yeah. So this is twenty nearly twenty grand of my own money. So this mm. is kind of a good, nice kind of microcosm of life generally. This is one this is one year's worth of universal thumps in the mm. face. Yeah. So anytime you hear, you know, kind of you see those personal development pictures of an iceberg of like success, what people see mm. and like the All little top, the little, yeah, the little top yeah. nipple is like money and cars and whatever, or whatever mm. success may look like. I mean, I'm not particularly materialistic, but that's why I dress like this. Uh, <laughs> Only has three t-shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, um, and then underneath it's like, um, like, you know, failures, loss of money, blah, 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 and all of those things. And that's just one year. So I've had to, I've had to think a lot about what, where I want Atlas to go in the next kind of five, 10 years. I would like, um, in five years, I would I would like at least two of our own facilities, Atlas One and Atlas Two. I'm just going to number them. It's easy. Smart. <laughs> uh, yeah. Good. Good structure system. And uh, and also for me personally, I like to travel. So the idea of being able to to do something retreat focused um, abroad would be would would be an amazing kind of inclusion to that to that lifestyle as well. Whether it's Spain or the kind of the Canary Islands. Or do you reckon you could do like a uh, the rock gym, like the Iron Paradise with Atlas, and just do a, like a pack up gym, fold up and just do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, our functional fitness model in terms of ADC, we are we don't. So obviously, I'm saying we're looking for our own commercial venue. We don't have anywhere at the moment. For those of you that are listening, we basically hire a five and a half thousand square foot community center hall which for context is massive it is huge like you don't get five and a half thousand square foot open floor gym spaces especially one where you'd be able to push a sled from one line to the next no. like it's it's a it's a big big space uh, and effectively we have a completely collapsible functional fitness model so we've got six olympic lifting platforms we've got 12 barbells we've got about 500 kilos worth of weights sleds deebles sandbags assault bikes rowers like ski oaks we've got, we've got everything and that's collapsible um, in terms of whether or not that would be shippable and movable from location to location. Start small, right? just do a UK tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Start lottery. small, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> so when you're talking about retreats, is that for you or taking people on retreats with you? Taking people on retreats with me. So that would be both me, my own clientele yeah. and <clears throat> kind of in the in the process at the moment of trying to build a little bit more of a personal brand of my approach to health and fitness. Yeah, wow, because that's really interesting. I follow a guy called Zach Homel that I send a lot of stuff yeah, over to you. Yeah. And again, he's got, um, this. he's out in America and he has a gym called Iron Valley Barbell. Yeah. And he does a load of men's men's retreats talking about just the mindset, about mm. being, being back in touch with nature as well. For yeah, well, I mean, people. that's a huge thing. A that's lot of my massive. stuff's on... 
on kind of natural living and ancestral yeah. living. So a lot of my stuff that's very kind of conducive. Yeah, like walking with without too. shoes and being like having yeah, your yeah, feet yeah. on the floor yeah, and stuff grounding, like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all the time barefoot. And yeah, all that exactly. Stuff. And yeah. just the benefits of going back to where we originated from, really. Um, so it's really funny you say that. Because yeah, it's well, almost that's, like that's an American mm, thing. Super I, on point with yeah. what we do as well. Amazing. Um, where can bit of promotion for you? Where where can people find Atlas Fitness? How how do they get in touch? So they are both kind of club Instagram handles are on mine at Jim H Galvin. Jim H Galvin. <laughs> um, so if you follow me on Instagram, then both uh, handles for each one of the clubs is uh, is is on there. Right, well, we'll make sure they're all linked as yeah, well. Thank you, buddy. And everything. Put it in the show Hopefully notes. Hopefully everyone goes and just absolutely floods you with a, a, a huge amount of love because even from the equestrian world, you have offered in this chat an insight on things that want from yourself as well that people yeah. aren't doing and how to achieve that. And if people take that initiative and maybe do that, you might see that And also it goes back to life as well. So many life lessons that, that people can take from this and hopefully yeah, hope start so, putting into, into their daily lives and try and gain something from this because hopefully it's been... Well, I've loved it. I don't know about you, Ash, no, but no, I absolutely. absolutely loved it and it's been so educational for a lot of people as well. Finishing up, um, to your younger self. <laughs> yeah, we were expecting this. You watch We do this every, se- uh, every time we do this. <laughs> yeah, we'll find a new thing to end up <laughs> soon, but this is how it's going. To your younger self, what advice would you give? So tying in perfectly to what we were talking about in terms of people maybe being scared of the gym or scared of doing other things and kind of pursuing other avenues, one of the biggest fear, probably the biggest fear of most people is um, kind of external perception. So how they're seen, right? And uh, same with the gym. People, if, if a gym was empty, people wouldn't be that. No one's scared of a barbell. They're scared of the other people in there, yeah. right? So yeah. they're scared of how they're seen. So one thing I would say, which is just like, I just read this quote once and I'll, I'll kind of, sh- I'll share this with you guys now. That's just so... I think the reason it's so powerful is the older that you get, the more true you realise it is. And I heard once that you spend the first like 30 years of your life worrying a lot about what other people think of you. You spend the next 30 years of your life worrying a little bit less about what people think of you. You spend the next 30 years of your life realising that no one was fucking thinking of you in the first place. <laughs> so that's just something, you know, again, like Brilliant. in a gym environment, like in a work environment, like wherever no one's looking at you anyway. And if they do, it's just a glance. Everyone is in their own head. Everyone is doing their own thing. And if you think you look silly, the chance in anything, the chances are that is a complete and utter kind of self-narrative that you might have, which I, again, I understand and I feel empathy if that's, if that's crippling and that holds you back. But just take solace in the fact that the chances are no one cares mm. and everyone is 1 million percent on their own journey so you can look silly and no one else will give it a second thought it's just you wow that's amazing jim this has been an amazing chat thanks oh, man I have, i've enjoyed being here thanks I for having me i have got one more question that i think hopefully on, a lot of people can relate to um is how do you keep on top of your self-improvement like how do you motivate yourself to keep on improving uh, I think I I think trying I think trying new things. Right. I think that um, I'm attempting to kind of stave off aging as much as possible. Yeah. But I would say it's actually easier because over, throughout throughout my life generally now, um, I'm probably healthier and more awake and more energetic now because of the, the things that I do and the way that I live my life than I was when I was in my mid twenties and a GB athlete. And that's from a few subtle changes. Intolerance testing is one of them. My diet is a lot, lot better. And again, better and worse is very subjective. Mm. So you need to find the right thing for you. Um, and, uh, you know, there's my sleep's a lot better, a lot, more, a lot closer to kind of natural living in terms of, you know, walking barefoot, that kind of thing. My, the quality of my sleep's a lot better. So just overall, I'm, I'm a lot healthier. And when you are healthier, you are naturally happier. And it's easier. Yeah. And it's <laughs> just easier. Mm. Like trying new things becomes easier. But, you know, staying on top of your own routine becomes easier. And once you start to experience what it's like to be happy, healthy, and have your brain working properly, mm. you're like, Jesus, I never want to go back. No, so yeah. you do start to look. It's like, oh, you know, do you not find it hard that you can't eat, you know, junk food twice a week? You don't want to go anywhere near no, it. But no. you realize how much better you feel when you actually start to do things right. And I think that's a huge thing because people forget what it's like to be healthy. <laughs> so it's only once they get to being healthy that, that they're like, actually, it's not hard at all to not go back. You never want to go back. No, exactly. Again, I've stopped this at like, really interrupted us ending this podcast no mate I've got I'm I'm happy happy. I'm happy I'm happy happy. I think this leads onto another thing talking about being naturally healthy and how gyms have closed down and then you think like 9 billion pounds goes into people with obesity 
from the NHS yet. We have closed down. We have closed yeah. down gyms, and they're saying it's because there's a major health issue. What's your uh, gyms open or closed? Uh, I think. Well, I'm, I, I, th- I think gyms open. I think yeah. the statistics kind of lobby towards that as yeah. well. I think you're. I, I, I don't know, but you. I, I don't know what the exact numbers, but you are infinitely less likely to be affected by COVID if you have a gym membership and, a re- and one that you regularly attend. Yeah. Uh, if you basically if you go to a gym, you're healthier. What an absolute shocker that is! I mean, who, <laughs> I know. Who, who who would have bloody who would have bloody thought it? But I think gyms open, especially for, especially for now. I mean, lockdown 1.0 here in the UK. It was um, it's for your international listeners. <laughs> uh, here in the UK was basically from the day that we went on lockdown to the day that we were released. I think this is correct. I heard that from that day to that day, it was the sunniest spring in recorded history. Was right? it? So we had more hours of sunshine. And better weather than we've ever had. And you think mental health is a problem then? You have yeah. no idea how bad it's going to be when every single day gets colder and wetter and darker. And the gym, again, with people being so busy, being mm. so hectic, it's solace for a lot of people. It's not a chore for a lot of people. For, for a lot of people, it's their, it's their de-stress, right? It's mm. their recharge. It's their decompression. Yeah. And I think taking that away is a really, really a super dangerous move. And I'd be... It's the consequences of it. Exactly. I'm going to outweigh the consequences of COVID. It's going to be huge. Yeah. Exactly that. And that's what people don't understand. Like I've had many a discussion with the elder community and I'm like, well, yes, I understand, but there's no reason why you can't be in isolation, but let the younger generation try and keep on top of their fitness and their well, mental health because if that goes, there are going to be some really tough times for a yeah, lot that's of true, people. Man. I so, think so for, for gyms, people that haven't been to gyms, my sort of main standpoint is um, there is a level of we're in it together, people that go to the gym. Mm. And there's a level of discipline and respect. And going back after lockdown 1.0 was cleaning every, all of the equipment down, everyone's social distance, masks are optional, but people do wear masks. It's a different level of we as a community want this to stay open and we will do everything we can yeah. to make sure this is, even though, yes, you're breathing heavily and you might be coughing or you're, you're speaking or whatever, they are minimising the risk to that. Whereas mm. eat out to help out, let's just go get pissed as much as you can drink before 10 o'clock and people are, I'm not being funny. I, I went out once and I was like, no. Yeah, but then yeah. again, you compare it to now. Okay, so the gyms are closed, but you've got supermarkets that are open and you've got garden centres. You go around and touch what you want. The no? garden centre thing makes yeah. no sense to me they at all, t- they t- What the hell are they doing over Exactly, they touch whatever they want. Nothing gets wiped out. Yeah. So... Fair enough, they might have a mask on the whole time, but the I can things. understand. Well, obviously, you need you need yeah, supermarkets. So, there you... should be like a no touch rule, a touch if you you're going to buy sort of thing. But yeah, supermarkets kind of. I think we kind of need. Yeah, no, but I'm but garden, saying, like, garden centers. Yeah, you, know, you can a... touch whatever you want, and it's not getting wiped down. Yeah. So you're going to be contaminated. Yeah, I may 100 percent agree with you, and I think gyms when when you adhere to the rules properly. They're probably one of the cleanest places in the UK right now. I think the amount of the, anti ranked there. number two. Yeah, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally just behind hospitals. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. That's so funny. Makes absolutely That's, no it's, sense. It's insane, right? I mean, again, it's such a, it's such a foundational. But there's such a link between regular exercise and maintaining your mental health mm. that it's it's a really really dangerous move to kind of. I mean, again, I I don't envy politicians at the best of times, especially not now because everything they do is kind of is under the spotlight but I think overall with different small businesses as long as people if they want to clamp down on the rules and be like you know anti back has to be used marks masks have to be worn if they want to do that then fine mm. but this, I still think they should have done just my personal opinion I think they should have done more because mm. if the people that are vulnerable have to self-isolate surely if the world keeps going it's better for, it's better for only them to self-isolate so when they come back out of their house in Herd seven immunity. months they, they, they come back to a functioning economy yeah yeah as opposed to they come out of their house and it's like it's like this dystopian ruin mm. of like exactly. of everything's kind of everything's messed up. Just one thing I'll say very quickly with everything we have spoken about yeah. with 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 your listeners, if they do have any kind of further questions on this, by all means, obviously, if you do, I've kind of already given my Instagram handle at Jim H Gavin. <laughs> um, we'll also <laughs> pop it up right there. Yeah, right boom. <laughs> yeah, there we go. No Cut. pressure, Giles. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I um, mean, if you have any questions about. And again, improving your again your kind of physique performance or your cognition with it again in terms of making your just in terms of reflexes and kind of priming and hacking your brain on game day or for training for riding then uh, then just kind of slide into my DMs and I'll be happy to help out I cannot stress enough on that that it was clear over this conversation people have realised actually 
Jim knows what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> um, having been through the sessions and known you for a period of time, uh, you are the kindest, most knowledgeable person that is going out of their way. And for Atlas, uh, the function of your company, the business model is so amazing and anyone for i mean people aren't going to travel from scotland i mean if they do i love that yeah, but respect. locally as well if you if you oh, please i urge you to look up atlas and, mm. and and if you are scared to make that jump to give that a go because it is it is amazing and it, i've seen it do mm. wonders for people and not just physically but mentally and uh, we'll make sure that your handles all of uh, atlases there you'll be able to see them in the links wherever the Mm. It is. Wherever, wherever. <laughs> here, 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 here. Yeah, it's very, very kind of you to say, mate. Appreciate it. Um, but thank, thank you for coming yeah. on. Yeah, mate, thanks for having me, man. I'm, 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 it's been an absolute honour. Thank you yeah. for having me. That's been Good. a privilege, mate. Yeah. Thank you so much. Only tools and horses. We're out. Let's go deadlift something. <laughs> <laughs>